Um, good afternoon and welcome to the final panel of the 35th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendenson Epic International Symposium on Preventing Genocide and Mass Atrocities. My name is Jesse Newman and I am a member of the 2019-2020 Epic Colloquium. I graduated from Tufts in May um, and due to the switching dates of the symposium and now are now living in Washington DC. Um, it is an honor to be speaking with these panels today who will be discussing the prevalence of genocide in the 21st century and contemporary events that are of concern to the international community. In particular, this panel will touch on the Rohingya crisis and what is happening in Xinjiang. We chose the topic of this panel because we wanted to emphasize that genocide and the perpetuation of mass atrocities are not only matters of history, but are very prevalent today. Through this colloquium, we immerse ourselves in the work of genocide prevention, and it is important to always be aware of human rights abuses occurring around the world and to work as an international community to stop them and prevent them in the future. So I'm just gonna to touch on the format of this panel, and then I will allow um, our three esteemed panelists to speak and um, deliver their introductory remarks. So each panelist will have five minutes for their opening remarks and then after all three panelists have gone um, there will be a time for a conversation amongst the three of you. Um, I will ask questions. The audience is more than welcome to send in questions through the Q&A function which you can find at the bottom of your screen um, and then after that we will move to breakout rooms where you will have a more a chance for a more intimate conversation um, with the panelists that you choose to enter the breakout room with. Um, so our first panelist will be Dr. Adam Jones. Dr. Jones is a professor <laughs> of political science and head of international relations at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. He is the author of Genocide, a Comprehensive Introduction, which is the most widely used textbook in genocide studies. He is also the author of Chomsky and Genocide, Under Submission to Genocide, genocide Studies and Prevention and is finalizing work on a new collection of essays, provisionally titled Sites of Genocide. Dr. Jones, the floor is all yours and you have five minutes. Thank you very much. I might just mention that that Chomsky piece has uh, now appeared in Genocide Studies and Prevention and can be read online. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, beaming in from Valladolid in Mexico and contemplating the question of genocide in the 21st century at a, I think, particularly tense and volatile moment in global politics and international relations. And maybe that's an appropriate place to begin uh, tracing something of the um, process of evolution of this field that we call comparative genocide studies and also the evolution of counter genocide strategies and advocacy projects. I think if we cast our minds back to the glory days of the 1990s, uh, I said slightly ironically, uh, but there was a sense, I think, back in that immediate post-Cold War period that many of the impediments to um, preventing and intervening in cases of genocide uh, had diminished and that there was now a greater possibility of and commitment to uh, genocide prevention and intervention, a more multilateral sense of obligation in that regard. And although 
in our field and in our world, the 1990s are remembered among other things for um, some very uh, brutal and uh, canonical now genocides, whether in the Balkans or especially in Rwanda and Congo, uh, we also saw uh, a, a substantial range of um, projects and norms evolving in the international legal sphere among a number of national governments. Uh, to try to confront this phenomenon systematically for the first time with some successes. I think perhaps most notably the events in East Timor in 1999. Um, one of the senses that we had at that time was that in the modern 1990s, 2000s, we were finally going to see an evolution of the world beyond some of those cofactors that have always been associated with genocide, particularly things like ultranationalism, uh, religious extremism, xenophobia, and the like. And I think when we look from our position today, we can see that many of those hopes in retrospect were naive and it has been um, a sobering experience to watch in the last decade or two. Uh, the revival of various forms of religious freedom, the revival of uh, forms of ultranationalism and xenophobia, even in countries that I had listed in previous editions of my textbook as success stories, uh, countries that seem to have uh, found some way to advance a kind of inclusive multicultural model. I'm thinking in particular of uh, the United States for reasons that will be obvious to most of us, but also, and in some ways even more disturbing, um, India, which I had previously cited as an example of a country that despite many outbreaks of intercommunal uh, conflict, had held together and had advanced a kind of cosmopolitan and integrated vision of citizenship. As we know, under Modi and his nationalist wing, uh, we are seeing things moving rapidly in the opposite direction, stripping of citizenship uh, in Eastern India in particular, targeting of Muslims and so on. So we seem to have fallen back into a number of pitfalls uh, that bode ill for the immediate future of conflict prevention and genocide prevention. Maybe the last point I'll make in these introductory comments um, also refers to something that has evolved in comparative genocide studies over the last two or three decades. And that is an increasing focus on structural and institutional forms of violence, including genocide. And I think in this age of COVID, uh, where we are seeing some of the structural imbalances, whether in class terms, gender terms, uh, the global ethnic hierarchy, uh, we need to recognize that the future challenges of prevention and intervention, uh, I think cannot solely be aimed at the type of typical political military genocides that we stereotypically associate with the term. We need to come to grips with the fact that uh, many more people die annually from structural forms of violence, including I think genocidal forms and our vision of what constitutes conflict prevention and genocide prevention in the future needs to be informed by that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our next panelist will be Professor John Packer. John Packer is Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. 
Professor Packer is an experienced practitioner with some 20 years working for intergovernmental organizations, including work in Geneva for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Labor Organization, and for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, investigating serious human rights violations in Iraq, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and also extrajudicial executions, arbitrary detention, forced disappearances, the use of forensic sciences, the use of civil defense forces, and the independence of judges and lawyers throughout the world. Professor Packer, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, and uh, let me just uh, say I'm glad to speak after uh, Dr. Jones's remarks, uh, because uh, what, what he set out is essentially to say that uh, no society is immune from the possibility of genocide, and notwithstanding our efforts uh, to develop means uh, of prevention in terms of uh, some structures, uh, that risk simply uh, exists. Uh, and uh, one thing I'll just mention a bit further to my own experience is I spent nine years as a legal advisor and director of the OSCE uh, High Commissioner on National Minorities Office and worked precisely in uh, former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, exactly on inter-ethnic conflicts, uh, trying to develop the uh, linkages uh, through integration programs with the European Union, NATO, bilateral treaties, multilateral treaties, uh, constitutional reform, all those things, uh, including institutional change, educational programs, and so forth, that would uh, eliminate the possibility. And, and I think what we can only say is that I, I still believe that's a correct approach, but uh, the best we achieve in that is a reduction of risk. We don't eliminate uh, the possibility. And we see that. Uh, I too, uh, Dr. Jones, would used to refer to uh, India as a relatively good example of uh, integrated multi-ethnicity and relative respect and so forth, world's largest democracy. Uh, but we see how easy it is for societies to slip backwards uh, or, or uh, populism and nationalism to um, uh, drive towards genocidal tendencies. I'm just going to say a few things about the Rohingya case because I've been involved in the Rohingya case since 1992 when I was a UN staff member first uh, assisted the first UN Special Rapporteur and traveled to Rakhine State. And that was in the shadow of the, um, the fourth major uh, exodus uh, of Rohingya, 1992. A lot of people think that the Rohingya case is something new. And actually here in Canada, uh, from where I'm speaking, uh, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights did a, a, a poll some, uh, about a year or two ago and found that 96% of Canadians had never heard of Rohingya uh, until uh, basically the 2017 um, uh, mass exodus. But let me just say a few things about that. Uh, the, uh, uh, prior to the two 2017 exodus of Rohingya, there have been four large exoduses going back to 1978, and already about 35 to 40 percent of all Rohingya in the world had already fled. So what I want to underline in this regard is it was no surprise. It should have been no surprise. Uh, uh, Dr. Jones mentioned the Rwanda genocide that's often known as the preventable genocide because even a year before the uh, 2004 uh, uh, mass killings in Rwanda, the UN Special Rapporteur on Independent, uh, 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 Rapporteur on um, Extrajudicial Executions, uh, Wali Bakr Najai, traveled to Rwanda and he issued a report to the then Human Rights uh, Commission where he actually literally said, there's going to be a genocide if nobody does something and uh, if nobody acts. Uh, you know, so, so we know that these are not, genocides do not occur uh, as a kind of spontaneous, uh, big surprise, sudden event. Uh, the, uh, if you look at the wonderful work of Genocide Watch and Dr. Gregory Stanton, you know, his, he's now, now well known 10 stages or steps of genocide. Uh, genocides are, uh, are preceded by progressive foreseeable steps. And in the case of the Rohingya, we had 30 years of public reporting at the United Nations. Uh, before the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Council, as it's now called, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, special rapporteurs, working groups, so forth and so on. So uh, this was something that Dr. Mangzarni, a, a specialist uh, and, and actually a Burman, uh, ethnic Burman from, uh, from uh, Myanmar, has uh, labeled as a slow burning genocide. It, uh, it's well known in this regard, but it makes the point that we should be watching for these matters. Uh, and if we again look a bit more at, at, the, at the Rohingya genocide, what does it teach us? It teaches us a few things. I mean, unfortunately, uh, it, it teaches us that genocides can occur without consequences to their perpetrators. At the moment, there are very few consequences 
for Myanmar or for any individuals connected with the genocide. In fact, about 85% of all uh, Rohingya have now fled their country of origin, living abroad. And I dare to say that the Rohingya genocide is an example of a successful genocide. It is, it's pretty much done. I mean, there's about four and a half, 450,000, 500,000, maybe 600,000 left in the country, a quarter of whom are in internment in camps. The government is quite satisfied with this result. Uh, no one has been held accountable and the exploitation and the aftermath is taking place. In fact, the stage of erasure is now taking place. So we have to ask ourselves in this context, what is it in the 21st century we could and should be doing about this? And, and I'm glad to know that um, I will be followed by someone uh, speaking about the Uyghur situation because that's another similar situation. And I wanna just say, uh, um, and finish by saying, we, we need to be attentive to the fact that the, the primary responsible is governmental that genocides on the whole are conducted by state authorities, not exclusively, not only, but principally. And the principal responsibility in our global system resides with states. And, and we have had to wait until last November when, when the smallest of African states, Gambia, had the gumption to bring a case under the Genocide Convention, only the third ever at the International Court of Justice on the Rohingya case. And still today, they stand alone in doing so. That is appalling. And so appalling that they're alone uh, and, and a tribute to them for bringing it. And so I would just say that this is in the 21st century, really a call to all of us. What is the condition of our world where a peaceful people that like the Rohingya, who are not connected to an armed conflict in their, his, in, in their last 30, 40 years, are subjected to a slow burning genocide that essentially succeeds. And on the whole, we stand and watch in full knowledge. That's the challenge. And that's what we have to address today. Thank you. <clears throat> you, Professor Packer. Um, so, and our third panelist who will deliver her introductory remarks is Will Hoja. Ms. Hoja is a Uyghur journalist, reporter, and TV anchor with over 23 years of experience. She graduated from Xinjiang Normal University in Ormqi, China in 1996 and began her career at Xinjiang TV, where she created the first ever children's TV program in the hosted a variety of TV programs in Chinese, and she joined Radio Free Asia in 2001. Ms. Hoja. Hello, uh, thank you very much. I'm very grateful uh, to be invited to attend this important panel. Uh, you know uh, more or less what my people, Uyghurs are going through at the moment. When it comes to talking of the genocide that the Uyghurs who are voiceless are subject, uh, I am today uh, the voice of those voiceless uh, Uyghur people um, under Chinese rule. As we know from the Holocaust, no genocide happens overnight, uh, nor does it target a few people. It targets the whole nation a whole people or a whole group because of their religion, race, political uh, reason, or something else. It's uh, determination to, the, <clears throat> to eliminate the target people is uh, vicious uh, as it intends to maximize the levels of uh, cruelty until they uh, totally killed or um, to never their life and to create their future. In this sense, the Uyghur genocide is not exceptional. We have, uh, we have been targeted by China since the invasion of our uh, country in 1949. We were given uh, two task options, either become Chinese, or to die. Uh, we did not have a third option. Jun Lai already expressed the um, intention of assimilation of so-called ethnic uh, minorities in 1956. China just waited for right time for force us to choose one option over the other. We have uh, proudly kept our cultural identity during all those 
um, years under the CCP. Finally, we have been categorized as an enemy from uh, within uh, under the pretext of anti-terrorism anti, uh, as we have refused to be uh, assimilate to, assimilated into being Chinese. Uh, China has been implementing this uh, assimilation process through, throughout this uh, decade until it has reached a point where it is technically uh, able to uh, source Uyghurs into being um, submissive to its uh, unquestionable power under millions of surveillance cameras, uh, politically able to um, source other nations to into silence over its crimes against humanity and uh, economically by using the uh, the one road and one built project to make them uh, support it all uh, costs. After all these uh, conditions are ready, it has uh, brazenly uh, started to carry out this heinous um, atrocity against Uyghurs since 2017. Millions of Uyghurs are now put in the concentration camps. Uh, I am saying millions because no Uyghurs is seen on the streets. All Uyghurs uh, Uyghur neighborhoods have become uh, deserted or started to be occupied by more Han Chinese um, uh, immigrants. Uh, and this is a massive number, but it is uh, the number of the perishing uh, disappeared and soul crushed human beings. This number tells us that the whole Uyghur life is destroyed beyond the um, reparation. Our um, existence is in greatest uh, peril ever. We have never met such a extensive uh, calamity, calamity in our history. Uh, in the source of uh, this uh, genocide, we have seen that so many Western um, corporation, uh, corporations have assessed uh, China with provision of high technologies. Almost all famous brands that uh, are part of our life, such as Nike, uh, Volkswagen, H&M, Zara, have all used Uyghurs as slave labor force. None of them admitted their uh, ethically um, on this um, unacceptable uh, behavior until unacceptable uh, behavior uh, until they were caught uh, red handed. The Uyghur genocide has uh, revealed not only dark sides of CCP but so of um, global corporations um, with uh, seek only money uh, at the expense of human dignity, lives, and the uh, aspirations. Uh, some days ago, uh, 39 countries uh, condemned uh, China's worst human rights violations of Uyghurs at the UN. Some others still are um, supporting China. This bit um, uh, mounting evidence that tells them uh, that there is an uh, unex, uh, unpresented genocide ongoing in 21st century. While it is not enough only to condemn China, which has not cared too much about international uh, condemnation so far. We still are great to uh, these countries. However, uh, the time is running out for Uyghurs. China is um, uh, the speed of eliminating Uyghurs, which is confirmed by a recent research um, conducted by 
ASPI. Uh, ASPI has identified more camps being built or being expanded. This shocked Uyghurs and many scholars, and they said, this shows, uh, you know, this shows us that China is defined to carry out this genocide until no Uyghur is left alive on the earth. Our existence is in dire situation if no immediate and effective action is taken against china to stop this genocide we may perish soon last year uh, at the ministerial to advance religious freedom in washington in july u.s uh, secretary of uh, state mike pompeo called the uh, internment camps in the uh, uh, uyghur region one of the worst human rights crises of our time and the truly the stain of the century and this will be the darkest stain on the conscience of humanity because nobody cannot say uh, that they don't know that we were genocide so that is why we call upon the U.S. Uh, to become on freedom and hope to stop China uh, designating from this inhumane policies and uh, practice in East Turkestan, uh, which we will call uh, Xinjiang, East Turkestan, uh, immediately. Uh, furthermore, we call upon the free world to speak out against China's uh, aggressive and uh, inhuman behavior. Some people uh, may say that is the action will be taken to free us from the death threats uh, of um, China. No, never. Uh, it will be also taken for your own peace in the long run. At the same time, uh, it will be taken for the sake of whole humanity, for the future of humanity is already at risk here under the uh, menacing threat of the CCP, which is uh, determined to rule uh, the whole world by imposing the China model upon all countries on the earth in a replacement of the Western model uh, at all costs. It is um, the same model that uh, is committing crimes against humanity. We, um, we call out uh, to fight against this uh, evil means, uh, means together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to give um, the three of you the opportunity to ask any questions um, to each other, if you have any after those introductory remarks. If not, I can also ask a question. Yeah, okay. sure. Okay. I'll ask a question. Um, so. I think that it's impossible to speak about the 21st century and then also without talking about the present climate that we're all living through, um, which is the pandemic, and how you think that is impacting um, human rights abuses and mass atrocities, Professor Packer, the Rohingya, Ms. Hoja with the Uyghurs and how that is affecting um, what is going on right now. I'll happily just jump in and just say that uh, I think it's very clear COVID uh, has done a few things. I mean, it's, it's revealed a number of things. One is, I think anybody who used to make the argument that, uh, you know, things don't concern me, though they're happening on the other side of the world, we're not connected and so forth. I think that argument's out the window. We clearly live in a complex interdependent world and we are closely intertwined and the fates of those on the other side of the world affect us and vice versa. So that's one point. Uh, the second is I think COVID-19 has also drawn back the curtains on so many things we pretty much knew were the case. Uh, tremendous inequalities, uh, relative vulnerabilities, 
you know, the whole uh, um, amazing, the, the, the things we used to hear from the 1% movement and so forth, and, and somehow we didn't fully digest. Uh, and so now we see what kind of risks and so forth uh, exist. Uh, the third thing is that uh, this has created a lot of space um, because it's generated a lot of fear, the vulnerability. And, you know, psychologists and social psychologists and uh, psychoanalysts and others will tell you that fear is the dominant uh, human uh, sentiment or trait. And, uh, and so this has uh, allowed many governments and other actors to use um, the opportunity to, for example, um, bring in um, mass surveillance systems, uh, basically uh, a lot of the steps that are associated with at least control. Uh, and I'm not, to, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, that some elements of public um, engagement and even fairly strong measures uh, are not merited, but the risk uh, of them uh, being used for nefarious purposes and the way in which we see in many places they're just so easily being implemented and clearly not related to COVID-19, but, but to other ends, uh, must be uh, tremendously disconcerting. So for example, with regard to the Rohingya, you know, the controls on uh, communications, which were already in place before COVID-19 took place, but have been accentuated. Uh, the, uh, you know, the controls on movement, so the ability of international civil society to actually access and monitor, that's been constrained and so forth. So I have to say that the risks have, have enlarged. At the same time, the last thing I'll say is, I remain an optimist because I think, I think this exposure um, uh, in many respects uh, has, has really drives us to an inescapable conclusion that we must absolutely be vigilant and cooperate with each other and that it really does matter the risks to others and that the only solution to that is for us to act together uh, and I think that there, there is a sense of that. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm t uh, I take um, uh, some optimistic uh, uh, enthusiasm from, uh, or optimism from uh, the COVAX initiative and, and others. I know it's problematical and so forth, but I, I think in this regard, if we could become serious about these things we know, uh, then we actually do know how to address them. And, 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 and in that connection, I will say that uh, it's not like we have no idea what to do about genocide and its prevention. We actually know a lot of what to do. We just haven't been doing it with much determination. And so I'd like to end there and say, we know how, we just have to do it. And I hope that COVID-19 has really shone a light to say, among other things, this is what we need to do. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Packer. Um, so we have a question from the audience. Um, do you think that the United States, as a world superpower, has a moral obligation to intervene abroad to stop genocide, even at the cost of our own national interests? Hmm. I'll take that one on. Okay. Um, everyone who is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, which the United States signed late, but better late than never, um, commits itself to, as a state, um, preventing and punishing the crime of genocide. And one would argue there that those states with the greatest capacity, and which is not simply a function of global power, for example, geographical contiguity might mean that a particular state has the greater obligation to intervene as Australia did in East Timor, for example, although only a, a middle power at best. Um, the challenge with the United States and with other great powers has always been to try to distinguish humanitarian intervention from imperial intervention. And also to wrestle with the fact that most successful international interventions have typically had a dimension of national interest to them. Think of India in Bangladesh in 1971, for example, uh, NATO in Kosovo or the Balkans more generally. Um, I think I think we need to emphasize multilateral forms and institutions with a particular emphasis 
on regional bodies. This is something that I think has emerged in the last two or three decades, particularly with the African Union and so on, the notion that uh, the neighboring states of a genocidal or potentially genocidal outbreak are physically best positioned and in terms of their own self-interest, probably most directly concerned and have the best chance of intervening in a way that does not necessarily um, uh, draw accusations of imperialism. So that is to be emphasized. And um, uh, Ms. Hoja was referring to the uh, Uyghur case and the United States express policy on that front. And this is an interesting example of a paradox of a representative of a government that has otherwise been known for profound xenophobia and racist dog whistling at every turn, but with regard to China and to the Uyghur case, because China is the preferred whipping boy of the Trump administration at this point, they feel that they can leverage the humanitarian discourse to present themselves, first of all, as a responsible humanitarian actor, and secondly, to pile further pressure on China, which they are always looking to do. I'm not rejecting what Pompeo says. Indeed, I think the United States has taken the rhetorical lead on the Uyghur genocide at a time when many states that you would expect to, for example, elsewhere in the Muslim world, also for reasons of national interest have kept quiet. Um, but I would like to see less of an emphasis on the traditional great powers as agents of intervention and greater emphasis on regional associations and multi multilateral bodies like the UN. Ms. Newman, could I just add one small point? Please do. Uh, so first of all, I agree entirely with what Dr. Jones just said. Uh, 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 and, uh, but I think I would like to take a little exception with the premise of the question, uh, because the last part of the question said, you know, in, without having an interest. That's, a, that's an analytical mistake. Uh, so first of all, the whole concept of, uh, for example, a, a, a peremptory norm, which uh, genocide is, that it is, uh, against uh, um, uh, all interests, basically, uh, and is prohibited in all circumstances, is that it, it offends a public interest, a shared interest. And uh, in, in formally, in law, in the Genocide uh, Convention, states which are a party to that convention are bound not only with regard to their own behavior within their own jurisdiction, but inter pares, between other parties. So they're supposed to cooperate. This is a duty. The UN Charter obliges in its own, uh, you know, article, uh, first and second articles, duties of cooperation. So they're, they're both, uh, one has to understand, it's not against the interest of a state to uphold uh, international law, and specifically the prohibition of genocide. It is in their interest to do so. Now, I, I know that that's not what the questioner meant. They meant the kind of narrow uh, interest of direct effect and so forth. But it's very important to understand this broader concept in a complex and independent world. And it takes the shape not only of the legal obligations, not just interests, but obligations. But in addition, for example, we must mention the responsibility to protect, which is a residual duty of all member states of the United Nations when a state is unable or unwilling to fulfill its responsibility, for example, on genocide, then it behooves the, re the residually the remainder of the international community to, to step forward, and not least on those states which are bound by conventions like the uh, Genocide Convention. Thank you both for um, those answers. We have another question from the audience. So this is a little bit longer, but bear with me. It's a great question. There seems to be a phenom phenomenon happening in the US where the violence against the Uyghurs is being labeled as anti-China propaganda and thus dismissed by a seemingly unexpected group of people um, groups on the left who identify with a more communist political ideology. How can our academic institutions challenge attempts to delegitimate the Uyghurs' efforts to name and address China's state-sponsored violence? Maybe Ms. Hoja. I don't know if we should hear maybe uh, yeah. Ms. Hoya first if she has oh, yeah, any sorry. comment on that. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I cannot give your uh, suggestion, of course, but I can talk about how we been affected and how we work on that. So as a journalist, um, I joined uh, RFA from 2001. Uh, RFA is the only outlet. We are the only outlet for this about 20 million Uyghur people uh, outlet uh, outside uh, the China that has uh, uh, Uyghur language. Um, it's team of only 14 to 15 journals has broken hundreds of stories, sometimes bearing sole witness to uh, China's alarming and uh, escalating crackdown on the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities group in the country. We've been at the forefront of the coverage of the among many other stories. RFA Uyghur Service have lead the world in its early exclusive reports of the mass detention and uh, creation of the high tech surveillance uh, state in the Uyghur region. The reports have paid a very heavy price. Uh, our families and loved ones were targeted as well as their sources putting uh, externary uh, pressure on them uh, as they continue to cover this crisis. But we don't have other choices. So I think we done uh, all use our ability right now. So I, I have to ask others, what's your part to do? Um, so I can just say that much if you're interested um, what we find out and about this um, internment camps, what is behind the wall. I would love to uh, talk about those points. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Can I Maybe uh, just mention there that with regard to the specific question about leftist politics on this issue, I think there is certainly uh, small groups, both in Canada and the United States, typically Communist Party adherents, who um, are kind of stuck without any other uh, meaningful communist state in the world that they can support. Uh, and so have taken this line of excusing Chinese uh, policies towards the Uyghurs. But I think it's important to note that that is not a broad leftist phenomenon. And if we think back a few years, for example, to the Free Tibet movement, which was quite powerful in the United States uh, and Canada, that was a predominantly left-wing initiative as well, not a right-wing one. Uh, and I think that there has always been on the left um, a commitment to the rights of national minorities that has been fairly broadly uh, respected. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, don't forget uh, this um, crisis uh, it's happening in the one of the most restricted media environments uh, where it is very hard to get news out uh, of this, especially true now. Um, so uh, it has been very difficult covering the situation facing uh, the Uyghurs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, Thank you. Sorry. And since 2017, um, the situation uh, intensified. Uh, before there was a surveillance state, before we were being put in detention camp by the hundreds and thousands and millions. Mm -hmm. Although we have an uh, advantage we are, uh, because we are Uyghurs, we know the language, uh, the cruelty we can understand and see what's happening from our sources. And 
you know, we can put together all those pictures because of Chinese propaganda, maybe it's difficult uh, for other audience. Uh, so if you pay attention, um, there's nothing left, you know, to know to about what's happening over there is close to genocide actually, right? So we have been seeing case of individuals sharing their options uh, and uh, raising issue publicly, uh, but we still need more voice, still uh, work uh, need to work together. Um, so what we covered, what we know about uh, based on our coverage. Um, so there is, a, you know, we were um, detailing the describe and the testified already where former detainees have reported being subjected to the torture, rape, sterilization, forced uh, separation with children and family, uh, indoctrination, uh, starvation taking place in those camp. So mentally and physically abuses. So I want to ask uh, professors, all those, um, what we covered, what we discovered, is that already meet the genocide action? Please clear, clarify. By that, is that, if study. that's a question, uh, I have a very simple answer, uh, which is uh, I invite everyone simply to read the Genocide Convention mm -hmm. and then just look at uh, the information, uh, not just presented by you, but the facts as they appear to emerge. And at a minimum, prima facie, there are numerous violations of the Genocide Convention. Uh, and I want to emphasize what Dr. Jones said you know, the duty under the Genocide Convention is not just uh, to not commit it uh, uh, or to punish those who might do it, but the duty is above all to prevent it. There's a positive wow. obligation. And so it's very clear, uh, even if not all of the elements of the news are uh, coming out are entirely accurate or entirely um, at the feet of the uh, state responsibility, uh, well, I would say the state is responsible in so far as it's supposed to prevent to take appropriate actions mm -hmm. uh, to uh, address those even private actors or those local authorities who may be uh, implicated. And they should be cooperating. And I want to go back to this point of cooperation because I saw in the question, someone said, yeah, but we don't want necessarily states to kind of unilaterally like America intervene. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that duty is a duty of cooperation and states should be actively for example, accepting uh, open uh, information, accessibility. One of the problems in both China and Myanmar with regard to the uh, uh, Uyghurs and the Rohingya uh, respectively, is the state is purposefully uh, foreclosing the possibility of access of independent persons to survey of communications and so forth. I mean, at a very minimum, the, that, that, that implies a negative inference about their I would say good faith, but, but certainly presumptions about obligations. So to my mind, it's fairly straightforward uh, that uh, if you just read the Genocide Convention, and, and I think that's the important thing to do, in the case of both Myanmar and China, they are state parties. So that was their own volition to become state parties. And that's a standard they have presented and they should cooperate fully. My, my simple answer is yes, it appears prima facie to be genocide. I would uh, second those observations. I would maybe also expand our discussion of the concept of genocide a little beyond the Genocide Convention, because I think uh, one of the things that has emerged from accounts of the Uyghur uh, genocide, persecutions, crimes against humanity, these are not mutually exclusive, terms um, is that it is a kind of multifaceted assault upon elements of Uyghur society, culture, religion, family life, education, and on and on. Um, it does intersect well 
with certain key elements and strategies that are codified in the genocide convention. It fits even more clearly with the original articulation of genocide by Raphael Lemkin in 1944, who defined it as a coordinated series of actions designed to undermine health, dignity, uh, you know, uh, uh, language, culture, etc. That sort of moves us into a little bit of the debate over this concept of cultural genocide as well, which is not a legal term, but is nonetheless regularly deployed in the case of peoples in particular, whether the Uyghurs or in North America. Last point, and maybe following on uh, John's comments earlier about um, grounds for optimism. It's quite clear, as you said, uh, Ms. Hoya, that, the, uh, that these events and atrocities are occurring in a context of an extremely tightly managed information system and media system. Both in the case of Xinjiang and Myanmar, much of the visual evidence that we have for what is going on comes from a newly broadly accessible form of information technology, which is satellite remote sensing, um, a technology that has been considerably democratized over the last 20 or 30 years. So if you think of the Rohingya situation, for me anyway, the first thing that comes to mind is the pictures of the villages where you have uh, the untouched Rakhine side of the population at a completely devastated and annihilated side of the village where Rohingya used to live. And that says a lot. It stands up in courts uh, to the extent that it is used in prosecution. And so at the same time as certain doors are being closed, through manipulations of information technology. So there are other avenues becoming available broadly, I would say. And social media, of course, is another example of that. Yes. Um, thank you so much. So we are gonna now move to breakout rooms because we have a lot of questions coming in. I wanna give the most opportunity for people to ask them to you. Um, so we just posted in the side um, chat panel, the three breakout room op options you can go to. Um, we're gonna leave this Zoom room open for like five, 10 minutes to allow people to figure out where they wanna go and then make that switch. Um, but I would really like to thank each of you for um, sharing your expertise, um, personal experiences and your insights on this panel. Um, it means so much to everyone in the Epic Colloquium to have um, such esteemed people, you know, coming and talking with us. It's definitely a major mark of my college experience. And so thank you so much. Um, thanks, Jeff. Thanks. So, um, yeah, people can start moving to the Zoom breakout rooms that have been uh, marked on the panels, if you see them. And feel free to chat me if you have any questions or um, technology, technological uh, difficulties. Should we lose, uh, leave this room now?